Okay, why don't we get started? Uh, my name is Stefan Haggard. I teach at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California, San Diego. And first of all, uh, welcome to all in the, in the GPS community and those outside it. We certainly hope that if you're uh, joining us on this type of activity for the first time, that you'll feel free to join our later seminars, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we launched this webinar series because we're all locked down and we felt it would be better to take advantage of that time in a productive way. And this series on Korea has been, uh, has received generous support from the Korea Foundation. We're very grateful for that. Those of you who are not familiar with GPS, we're a school, we're the school in the University of California system devoted to the study of international affairs. We also have a public policy and five other degrees, but we have a specialization in Korea and teach classes on Korean security and the Korean economy. And I direct the uh, Korea Pacific program with my colleague, Moon Sub Lee, who'll be talking to us uh, today. Before we get into today's event, uh, I want to tell you about some things that are coming down the track over the next several weeks and invite you to go and sign up for these and register. We tried to keep these seminars at the same time each week, but unfortunately, because of scheduling commitments, we were unable to do so. So please check. Um, later this week, May 6th, uh, Gary Samore will be talking about living with the North Korean bomb. Uh, Dr. Samore has been, has a tremendously long and distinguished career dealing with non-proliferation issues. And then on May 11th, uh, Jeff Lewis from Monterey is going to talk to us about tracking the North Korean missile program. And then on June 1st, we have an event I'm particularly excited about which is that Professor Todd Henry in the history department will be giving a talk about his new book, uh, Queer Korea. And uh, he'll be joined by Jin Kyung Lee, uh, Jin Kyung Lee, and we'll have a discussion of that uh, very exciting project. So let me uh, introduce uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, basically, I'm going to talk for about five or 10 minutes about uh, some general features of the South Korean response to the COVID crisis, and then introduce my colleague Moon Sub, who's been doing some fascinating research uh, that's generated out of the cell phone data, which as I'll explain, the South Korean response to the crisis has allowed us to access. Uh, just in terms of procedure, let me establish a few ground rules. Uh, if you would like to pose a question, just do, through, uh, do so through the question and answer function. Um, we're not going to be looking for raised hands. Uh, we have a pretty good audience today, and I can't monitor the chat function in full, but I will be looking at the questions and answers coming in. And if you have something you would like to ask us, um, we'll, we'll uh, respond. Okay, uh, let me jump in uh, and start by showing you a little data about how the countries in Northeast Asia and Southeast Asia responded to the crisis and make a few general comments on Korea to set up a Munsub's talk. Uh, first of all, this is um, some data that I pulled together with my assistant, Corey Rogers, uh, on the path of caseload in Northeast Asia after the first 100 confirmed cases. So this is looking at how things evolved in each of the Northeast Asian countries in the United States after the cases were detected. And several features of here will be familiar to uh, most of you, but not, perhaps not all. Notice that this is a logarithmic scale here on the left-hand side. It goes from 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000. So um, this is what we call a log scale. And notice that if we look at South Korea, the United States, and China, all of them have this very, very steep path early in the crisis with very dramatic increase in cases. But notice that South Korea uh, flattens the curve. This is the classic flattening of the curve. And as of uh, yesterday, uh, Korea was in the enviable position of only having about a dozen cases. And uh, the, uh, some of those, in fact, I believe the majority of them were actually from abroad. Notice that the United States has still to flatten the curve. Some of the other countries um, like uh, Taiwan and, 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 uh, and Hong Kong have done very well also in moving in this direction as China did ultimately. But Korea is certainly considered 
uh, one of the uh, success cases. So let me uh, just talk very briefly about some of the factors that have influenced uh, Korea's uh, performance in this regard. And I'm gonna start by um, saying something about the mayor's uh, episode of a coronavirus, which broke out in 2015, 2016. And oddly, having a prior experience with this kind of coronavirus actually stood South Korea in very good stead. Because at that juncture, it had to grapple, as we're grappling now, with setting systems in place to test, to contact trace, to quarantine. And they had to learn that um, in, uh, with a virus that uh, was not as contagious as COVID-19, but was more lethal. Um, I think Korea had about 140 cases, but it had almost 40 deaths at that time. And tremendous resources were on trying to get that, that, um, that virus tamped down. Uh, but um, once that experience was put in place, uh, and with laws that had changed in Korea that were passed in 2016 dealing with the uh, control and prevention of infectious diseases, the Korean government uh, acquired really unique capabilities and ones that we've seen debated in the United States, but so far have, have not moved towards implementation. So first, uh, very quick response with respect to the private sector, bringing them in on testing. Uh, within a week of the first case being detected in South Korea, which, by the way, came on the same day as the first case in the United States, uh, the uh, Moon administration had pulled together a group of private sector firms and gotten them moving in the direction of, uh, of creating uh, test platforms that could subsequently be distributed. And in fact, that research had already been ongoing from mid-January, when, uh, when the virus uh, information on the, uh, the DNA structure of the virus had been transmitted from Chinese researchers. Um, so very rapid response with respect to texting, but probably the most distinctive feature of the South Korean model and also in, in Taiwan and Hong Kong in somewhat similar ways is that laws passed in 2016 provided the government with extraordinary access to cell phone and credit card data. And what this meant was that the government could effectively track people who were, uh, were sick, uh, their geographic location could track them quite precisely and could also transmit that, uh, that information to the public. And in fact, the laws passed following the mayor's virus obligated the government to share that information with the public. And in addition to a, a very intensive contact tracing regime, this combination of identification of cases, contact tracing, and the use of card and cell phone data allowed them to undertake a very, very targeted approach to closing down significant clusters of the disease within the country, such as those which broke out in Tegu uh, around this, um, this uh, church, uh, Shinchojin Church, which uh, was seen as uh, an epicenter for perhaps as many as a half of the total cases that uh, South Korea subsequently experienced. Now, obviously, um, questions of privacy, uh, of the distribution of information, uh, of surveillance, all of those questions are interesting ones that we can perhaps talk about. But they do provide a unique opportunity to monitor how the uh, disease progressed and how social distancing worked. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Munsub, who's going to talk about some of his new research in this area about how this data can show us things about precisely the way that social distancing works. Munsub? Okay, thank you, Steph. I will share my screen from here. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so this is Munsub. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. So thank you all for joining and thank you, Steph, for the great discussion. Here in the talk, I'll be more specific. So what I'm going to do is measuring the cost of the secrecy, so the, the measuring the welfare consequences of the disclosure of the COVID-19 cases in Korea. 
And this is the joint work with the David Arhente and Chang Tai She. Let me give you the brief overview about the South Korea's case. So in the fight against the COVID-19, the South Korea's case stands out. So if we go back to the February, South Korea was the one of the four countries that has been widely covered by the US media with uh, China, Italy, and Iran. So for sure, there was the large outbreak, but for somehow, by somehow, the South Korea was able to flatten the curve as step show before compared to other countries. And at the same time, South Korea has not shut down its economy. So today I'm gonna to focus on the one specific distinct strategy. So this is the South Korea strategy, but there are other the Asian countries, China, Taiwan, and Singapore that has implemented a similar strategy. So the first is massive testing combined with the contact tracing, the, the, the information coming from the credit card, cell phone, CCTV, and so on. And the disclosure of the detailed the root information of the confirmed cases. And this disclosure has been possible under the social acceptance of surveillance when using the mobile phone data, credit card data, and so on. So, so the, as Steph mentioned, that is also associated with the Korea's the experience with the MERS in 2016. So at the very early stage of the spread of disease, non-pharmaceutical interventions, so-called the community mitigation strategies, are more are quite effective. And many countries in the world have implemented the different strategies to slow down the geographical spread of disease. Most of you guys, including me, are living in the US following the lockdown stay at, at home order for more than 30 days. So the lockdown is one potential the mitigation strategy. And you can also think about the case of Wuhan. So the China shut down the epicenter. And another strategy is the information disclosure. So then the people are gonna change their commuting behavior based on the information given to them. So in this talk, so we are going to quantify the effectiveness and the costs of the different mitigation strategies, mainly focusing on the change in people's commuting choice during weekends and the weekdays. So weekends, people go out to the district to go to the restaurant, movie theater, and so on. And during the, the I mean, that's during the weekend and during the weekdays, people go to work. Let me tell you a little bit more about the public disclosure and what has been the response, what has been the effect of the public disclosure. So Korean people receive the text messages whenever there has been the new cases in their district, along with the timelines of the infected people's the travel route. So sometimes it could include the name of the restaurant, it could include the name of the schools and so on. So by doing so, the Korean government could maximize the odds of testing infected people. Because some people getting the text message, okay, I have been there, I have been to the same restaurant as the infected case, okay, so, and I have some symptoms, so then I should go to the hospital and get tested. And second, this information allowed people to engage in, we call the targeted social distancing by avoiding the places visited by those that tested positive. So people didn't go to the, the specific district, the specific uh, subway station, and so on when they get that information. So this is a smartphone app that has been developed by the college students in Korea. What you are seeing on the map is the northern half of Seoul. Seoul is the capital of Korea, and you are seeing the Han River here, and this is the northern half of the Seoul. And each dot represents the places visited by the positive cases. This might be too small for you to see, but it also has the number on the top of each dot. That's the patient number. So the information was detailed enough for the people to spot the exact location on the map. 
So that's the degree of the information disclosure. And this is the anecdotal evidence, what has been the effect of the public disclosure, how the people change their behavior. And this is the, from the one newspaper article, I found it interesting. On March 28th, a patient had briefly stopped by to order a drink at a coffee shop. Two days later, the district officials fumigated the coffee shop and the coffee shop was disclosed as a place visited by that specific patient. Not surprisingly, the people got the text message and that information was public. So not a single customer showed up. So there is also the privacy concern. So nowadays the Korean government changed the policy. So they are deleting the information for the more than the 14 days. So now if you go to the Korean CDC, still the detailed root information is available, but you can only see the cases that has been detected for the past 14 days. Okay, so having said that, that's the background of my research. Let me quickly tell you about the data I use and some empirical findings from there. So then after that, I will introduce the model very briefly because I'm gonna model the situation by combining the, the, the canonical models in epidemiology and economics. And then given that model, I will make some prediction and so provide you some evidence-based policy recommendation. So that's the plan for the talk. Let me briefly talk about the data. So we exploit the foot traffic data provided by a large, actually the largest telecommunication company, which is the SK Telecom. So that shows the number of the subscribers present at any point in time in 25 districts. So we're gonna use the data from Seoul. So this is the data from Seoul and the, the, we are gonna model the dynamics in Seoul. The cool thing about the data is it splits the users by gender and by age group. So here in the talk, we're gonna use the data for January and February. So the SK Telecom, they have a very detailed micro level data at, for, each, at each for each subscribers. So that information has been shared with the government whenever that subscriber was found as positive. As a researcher, I mean, for the privacy concern, we don't have that big data, but we are basically exploiting this foot traffic data provided by the private company. Still, we can see the change in the people's behavior. So let's see that. Uh, this is the peak example of the data because it is gonna help me to explain you about uh, some of the empirical findings we have. Let's just focus on the first row and the third row. So this is data from the January 5th, which is the Sunday. And we know the number of the people, the subscribers at 3 a.m. in Gangnam district, which is the one of the downtown districts. From this specific age group 20 to 30, the women. If we compare the number of people at 3 a.m. and 3 p.m for the same demographic group, we see that the number of the people has increased. So you can, we can interpret that uh, the number of the people at 3 a.m. that's close to the number of the residents. And uh, there are 50% more people during the day. So people are coming from other districts in Seoul or sometimes from outside Seoul to meet people, to meet friends, or to go to the restaurants, movie theaters, and so on. So this is the information we have from the foot traffic data. This is the map of Korea. I wanna show you the map of the excess people. So I told you in the previous example, there were 50% more people during the day. So we can calculate that excess people, the difference between the number of people during the day and the number of people during the night for each district and then put them on the map. So in the February, people went to uh, Jongno district, Jung district, Gangnam district, I mean that's during the weekend, uh, people went there. And then you see that in the February, the color, color becomes lighter. So meaning that the excess people in those the downtown district has decreased. So that shows the overall people's the change in behavior. People went out less in February compared to January. And then the first case was found in Seoul on January 30th. 
So that's basically the date of the first case on the install. And there is also interesting heterogeneity across the demographic groups. So this one shows the percent change in percent change of the people in downtown from January to February. So for almost all demographic groups, we see the negative numbers, meaning that people came to downtown less and less in February compared to January. But then during the weekdays, if you look at the working age, the population, which is from 30 to 50, there were not many changes in the commuting pattern. Because at least in February, okay, step. Um, yeah, Munza, if I could just ask a question. Uh, Jungmin Lee is asking us what, what you mean exactly by foot traffic. Yeah, so the foot traffic, uh, so, okay, so uh, the foot, foot traffic. So the foot traffic is the, okay, so this is the naming of the data and the naming of the data. And then the foot traffic, so the idea, the, the data set could be the number of the people, the matching the, all the origin and the destination. So here, we don't know whether, where those 20,000 people are coming from. But in general, the definition of the foot traffic data is showing the number of the, in, number of the people in every district in different times. So that right. shows the people's commuting pattern. But I think the, the important point is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that these numbers here reflect the presence of a cell phone in that yes. area, correct? Yes, yes. Cell phones should be on to be captured in the data. The number of, of discrete cell phones by district. Exactly. The number yeah. of active discrete cell phones by district. Yes. Good. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let me continue explaining about the graph, which is very interesting showing the demographic, I mean, heterogeneity by demographic groups. If you look at the week, weekdays, there were not many changes among the working age population, especially for May, because the working from home, that option hasn't been offered much and missed in February. And you also see the larger response from the vulnerable populations. Here, the old aged population, both during the weekdays and the weekends, because they were basically facing the highest risk. Fatality rate and then the infection rate, it is known to be high, much higher for those the vulnerable populations. Here, the old aged population. And during the weekend, so still working age the population, they have an option to change the destination. They can meet friends in their home district instead of going to Gangnam. So they were the last and the last people were going to downtown in February. So this shows the, 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 the potential margin of the adjustment has been, uh, that has been different uh, the, for the different uh, demographic groups. Uh, and we also did some statistical analysis. We did run some regression and that shows that the people went to the district less. When more cases have been found from the district and more cases have visited the district. So we're gonna call that as a targeted social distancing. So whenever people see the information that, okay, so there has been the confirmed case in Gangnam or there has been the confirmed case in another district, but we know that they, the, he or she has ever visited the places in Gangnam. So then what we see from the foot traffic data is that the people are going there less. And that has been proven using the foot traffic data. So then what is the question for the social scientist? So we wanna know the benefit and the cost of the information disclosure. So we can anticipate the benefit because that could slow down the spread, geographical spread of disease. So people are going less to the downtown or less to the place with the higher risk. But at the same time, it is also costly because during the weekdays, you should work from home if you don't wanna to go to your workplace and you should find another district, you may prefer less. So there should be output and the welfare cost of information disclosure. So we're gonna quantify that. So then to do so, we need a model. 
and we need a model combining the epidemiology and economics. So that's what we are going to do from now. So this is the epidemiology side of the model. This is a very standard, the textbook version of the, the, the epidemiology model, so-called the SIR, Susceptible, Infected, and Recovered model. So we divide all the population into four groups. Some of them are susceptible. They could be infected at workplace. So then they move to the pool of the infected people. Some of the infected people are tested and detected and they are quarantined or hospitalized, but not all of the infected people are tested and detected. Some of them are recovered or dead without being tested. And these days we know some numbers. Uh, there has been the random testing in Iceland and there has been the random testing in the little county in the US. So what is known is that actual number of infected people is on average the 10 times larger than the number of the detected cases. So many of them are recovered or dead without being tested. So this is the whole dynamics, the spread of disease. And some of them are recovered and some of them are at dead. So we are going to use the fatality rate, the 1%, and the 1% is from the diamond cruise ship and then the one small county in Italy. But uh, uh, yeah, so, the, so that's how we are, uh, we are the parameterizing the, the model. So the, here, the key moments are going to be the general transmission rate, detection rate, and then the fatality rate. I want to show you the one example of the potential infection at workplace. And we are only modeling the infection at workplace. So we are not modeling the infection during the commuting. So people go to the workplace, pe people can go to the workplace by subway or bus. So to simplify the discussion, we are not modeling the, the chance of the getting infected during commuting, say in the subway or bus. So you should interpret the, our model as the model where the people are commuting by the car. So there is no chance, there is no possibility of getting infected during the commuting, but there is a chance of being infected at workplace. This is the one example of the infection that happened in the workplace. Sometime in March, so there has been the outbreak of disease in a call center located in Guro district in Seoul. 97 cases were found from a specific call center and, the, and then the building had the 19 floors and then the, that call center was using the three or the four floors but 94 out of the 74 total confirmed cases came from this 11th floor. So what you are seeing is the map of the floor. So you see the desk and chair. So this is the core center. So you should imagine the one person for each desk and the chair combination. And the blues are the confirmed cases. So you see that the people are basically working everywhere. And then the spread of disease was concentrated on the specific part of the 10th floor. So this shows the example of the spread at workplace. Now let me talk about economics. So this is the economics model in a nutshell. So the workers decide where to work based on the individual effective wages and commuting costs. During the weekend, they decide where to go based on the individual preferences and commuting costs. And commuting cost is a function of the physical distance and the likelihood of the exposure to disease. So once you see more cases in the specific district, the implicitly the commuting cost increases. So given that information, some workers may choose to work from home during weekdays and go out to less preferable district during the weekends. So under this model, we anticipate output and the welfare loss associated with the targeted social distancing. So that is going to be the cost of the, of the information disclosure. So let me show you the simulation wizard. So this shows the simulation wizard from the day zero, which is the January 30th, until 900 days. 
and this shows the the share of the population for each five groups starting from susceptible infected quarantine recovered and deaths and i should tell you that this prediction uses the information until february so we should interpret that as the upper bound because more mitigation policies has been implemented including the social distancing campaign in march and april and in one year two years we hope that the vaccine is going to be developed but this is informative to know the upper bound and at the same time based on this simulation result i'm going to show you some counterfactual exercise what would have happened if korea didn't disclose the information that's where we are going to do next but here, the, the, the spread of disease is very slow compared to the, if you have ever seen the similar figure coming from California or the Trump administration. So they were anticipating the share of the infected people at the peak around the 30 to 40 percent, depending on the parameterization. What we are anticipating from the Seoul is that the share of the infected people at the peak is going to be around the 2 to 3 percent. And the share of the quarantined people is going to be very marginal. You cannot even see this black line. So that is going to be way less than 1%. Uh, and this is the anticipated output. So let me go back to the simulation and give you the one additional information. It is predicted that the peak of the disease is going to be from 200 to 300 days. At the peak, what we are anticipating is 6% of GDP loss. So this is the aggregate output starting from the initial period. And then at day 100, we anticipate the 1% GDP loss. And at the peak, we anticipate the 6% GDP loss in Seoul. And there is a very slow recovery and it doesn't, it, it never goes back to the original point because some, unfortunately some people are gonna die and then they are not participating in the labor force anymore. Is that this collect any yep. question? Have, uh, just again to clarify, mm -hmm. so this is from the identification of the first case? This is from the identification of the first case, which is the January 30th, yes. Okay, boy that's a long time for for the welfare effect bottom, isn't it? I mean it's it's two-thirds of a year, right? More. Yeah, that's yeah. That's what is predicted, yes. Okay, so let me tell you about the role of disclosure. So having this model, we can do some counterfactual exercise, shutting down the information channel. So what would have happened if the Korea didn't disclose the information? So what we found is that the information disclosure reduces the number of deaths by your heart. Why? because the spread of disease has been slowed down through the targeted social distancing. People didn't go outside much, so the geographical spread of disease has been slowed down. But there's no free lunch. The information disclosure doubled the output and the welfare loss because the, if people choose to work from home, they are going to be much less productive and even during the weekend, they should go out to less preferable uh, district if they found uh, the, the cases from their first choice. So there is the output and the welfare loss associated with uh, the fact that people go to the second best or the third best places during weekdays and weekends. So the, this is interesting, the trade-off, the policymaker pays the trade-off between the public cash saving more life and then the output and the welfare. So there is the trade-off between the public health and the output welfare. So what the information disclosure did in Korea was saving more people, but at the same time that has increased the output and the welfare loss. Let me quickly tell you about the other mitigation strategies. So in the US, we have implemented the lockdown, and then we can also think about the possibility of shutting down the epicenters. First of all, the lockdown could be equally or more effective slowing down the disease, but it is much more costly in welfare. Why? Because under the lockdown, people cannot go anywhere. Under the information disclosure, and let me call it the voluntary lockdown, people change their destination. 
under the information disclosure, people can, can still go to the second best or third best uh, district. But under the lockdown, people cannot just go outside. So the welfare loss coming from the lockdown policy is huge. So if I compare the lockdown policy equivalent to the information disclosure in terms of the number of the people we can save, so then the welfare loss from the lockdown policy is much larger. So under the parameterization in the Seoul, the, what has been proven is that the information disclosure policy has been more effective than the lockdown policy. Even though lockdown policy has never been implemented, this is, these are all counterfactual exercise, thought experiments, but through the model. How about the shutdown? So the shutting down the four districts with the initial cases is not effective the slowing down the disease. And it is also not feasible. So I cannot suggest to the policymaker, okay, you found the four cases from the four districts, so let's shut down the four districts in Seoul. That's not feasible. But even if it is feasible, it is not effective because the Seoul is so interconnected. And whenever you detect the case from the certain district, in other district, there are certain number of the infected people. So the shutdown, the strategy is not effective. Yeah. So I have another question here. I just want to feed you because it's yes. important that our audience understand this. The question is about the difference between information disclosure and lockdown. Mm -hmm. And it's just important to emphasize that if my understanding is correct, the information disclosure is not associated with a lockdown. In other words, individuals make the choice based on the information they have. The government doesn't dictate that businesses are closed, but rather they effectively are closed because if there's information that someone's there, no one goes to them. Yes, that's not yeah. true. Yeah, that's okay. exactly what is happening. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everyone understands this. It's a, it's a very important point. The question is whether you have a mandate to lock things down, the government dictates that they close, or whether you simply provide information to citizens and then the citizens make the choices about where they go. Yes. Okay, so this is my last slide. So this research combines the models in epidemiology and economics, but this research cannot tell optimal policy because there is always the trade-off. So we give a policy options with the anticipated predicted result to the policymaker. So then what policymaker should do is comparing the options, say for the information disclosure. So there is the benefit of the, on the public health, but there is the cost on the welfare and the output loss. So we give the number and then we are not taking a stance, but that is going to be, that is going to depend on the specific weight the policymaker is going to assign on the public health and then output for the, the welfare loss. But what I can tell is the lockdown policy is proven to be the less effective compared to the information disclosure in the case of Seoul and List. So that it. was uh, fantastic. I, we can all virtually clap for that performance. It's a wonderful piece of research. Um, let, me, let me pose the first question. And then please, if you have any questions, please send them uh, to Q&A and I'll immediately uh, pass them on to Munsub. So there is a question you suggested, it seemed to me, that lockdowns could be more effective than targeted information, even though they're much more costly. But I'm not actually sure that's correct because even if you have a, a, a lockdown, you can't assume that that lockdown will be maintained effectively and particularly over time because there's a behavioral issue as well. I can say that we're locking down, but then if you don't lock down or people decide that they simply are gonna go out anyway, you could be in the worst of both worlds, which is that you have a lockdown, but it's not complete but at the same time, you don't have information to make judgments about where the safe places are to go. So, um, so do, you, do, you, do you think or do your models show that lockdown uh, is actually more effective from a public health perspective? I don't, I'm not sure that's true. So yeah, Steph, that's a great point. So we are assuming the complete lockdown, so meaning that people follow the government's order. So in that sense, the lockdown could be effective in our model, 
but we see the people at the beach these days, right? So if the people are not following the government's order, so then lockdown is going to be even less effective. So taking into account that fact, the effectiveness, the difference in the effectiveness between the information disclosure and the lockdown could be even larger than what we found. But what we are assuming is the complete lockdown. People are following the government's order. Right. Well, until we get more questions, um, everyone, the, the disadvantage of listening to me uh, ask one of questions. I think this is fantastic with research. I'll get to a question from Sam Bo in a minute. Uh, but let me just ask a more general question about the response to targeted, the targeted information approach. Do we have any data on public opinion with respect to the acceptance of the targeted information approach or what the public thinks about the uh, questions of surveillance and privacy uh, that are related to this strategy? So that's a very interesting point. I'm not aware of any survey showing the exact number. But as we discussed uh, both, I mean, it has been mentioned both by Steph and me. So there was the kind of social agreement after the MERS. So the MERS was, the outbreak of the MERS was in 2016, which was the four years ago. So this is the time when we should revisit that social agreement because there has been the concerns. I mean, there is, there is the concerns for the privacy issue. And that's also why the Korean government decided to delete the de detailed information for the, the right. for more than the 14 days. It would be great. I mean, that's what we should do for now. So getting some, the, the, there should be some survey asking that question and then collecting the people's opinion on this information disclosure and contact tracing in general. Right. Uh, so Sam Bo has a question and it's a really good one. It's uh, the question of whether if the U.S. tried to implement a federal information disclosure policy in place of a lockdown, whether there would be too much partisan pushback. And so I'm not going to uh, ask you to speculate about American politics, though I invite you to do so if you choose. But let me add to Sam's question, are there alternative ways of devising an information disclosure strategy that might not go to the Korean extremes. So for example, I can look on the UT and I can find out how many cases there are at uh, sub areas of San Diego, but I could imagine one in which that was made narrower, for example, uh, in geographic space so that somewhat more information would be provided, but not down to the level of the individual. Is there any reason to believe that other designs of uh, information provision strategies could still mitigate uh, the caseload? Okay, so first of all, I will defer the question about the US politics to you, Steph. So <laughs> I want you to talk about the, the, the lockdown policy and its implication for the US politics. Uh, answering to your question about the different the forms of the public disclosure. So there are two types of the information we are considering in the model. First, the number of the confirmed cases by district. You can also check that from the US if you watch the, if you care about the news and watch the news, so then you can get that information, but it's not the same as the getting, you getting the text message. And the second information is the detailed the travel route. So in the model, what we are doing is that what would have happened, the Korea used the partial disclosure strategy. So what I mean by the partial disclosure strategy, still sending the text, but only with the number of the confirmed cases by each district, not disclosing the detailed the travel log information. So then that could still the mitigate the, the, the spread of disease at, the, at the, the lower the output or the welfare loss. So the effectiveness of the partial disclosure is kind of in the middle, full disclosure, the, the no disclosure, and then effectiveness of partial disclosure is in the middle. So it is totally possible to come up with, to design the alternative way of the information disclosure. Right, yeah. I, I've got a, a great question from Charles Elkin and Sharon Beckus, but I'm just gonna jump the queue to a question from Jeremy Joseph. Uh, he asks, was there any pushback from South Korean population on a lockdown by arguing that the economy was going to be harmed? 
Now, um, as we've said, you know, Korea did not go the lockdown route. They went this information disclosure route. But was there pushback in South Korea from information disclosure? Because, for example, certain businesses or certain districts might have experienced more uh, harm as a result of that than, than others. I mean, totally, there was the pushback and all places have, that has ever been visited or has been fumigated, but still the people didn't go to those places. Yes, there has been the pushback and it was costly. So there has been the, again, output and welfare laws associated with the information disclosure. And Korea was kind of lucky not to go to the point where we need to impose the lockdowns. Right. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize this point enough that the strategy that the Koreans and Hong Kong uh, and Taiwan pursued did not involve general lockdowns. There, there were school closures in, in Japan and in Korea, but there was never a general, the kind of general lockdown. And the reason there was not a general lockdown is because this strategy managed to flatten the curve early enough that you could get to a point when the increase in caseload is now down to below 10 cases a day in the entire country uh, and in a country which saw its first case at the exact same time as the United States. Uh, there are two other very interesting questions here and a bunch of others in the queue. I'm, I'm gonna start grouping these together. Uh, so Charles Elkin asks, can we model compliance with lockdowns as endogenous? That is, people will comply if the benefit of doing so is greater than the cost to them. And another question from Sharon Backus, which approaches the same question from a different angle. She asks, is the compliance to lockdowns different in different cultures? So do, do cultural factors affect the extent of behavioral compliance? Okay, those are really interesting and uh, important uh, questions. Okay, so let me first think about, uh, let me first answer to the Charles question about the uh, compliance with the lockdown as endogenous. Um, I mean, I definitely believe the compliance with the lockdown is endogenous. It depends on the individual cost and it depends on your political view. So, so there is the, 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 the tons of empirical evidences that Republicans were following the social, the, the social distancing order more than the, the, demo, the demographic the, uh, than the, the other parts. So totally, it is endogenous and I believe it depends on economic, political, cultural and so on, the many factors. So Steph, I, I would be happy if you have something to add on the top of that. Well, I think I would just want to uh, you know, uh, offer something with respect to cultural practice. I think this is gonna be a very interesting area of research. And let me just give one example that's almost a cliche, but I think it has uh, quite significant and takes us to another question. So for example, the use of facial masks is widely accepted in uh, Korea, Hong Kong, and Japan. Uh, also, people don't kiss uh, or even shake hands in Japan to the same extent. On the other hand, if you look at a case like Indonesia, this is a very social practice. During Ramadan, people who live in the cities will go back to the countryside. Uh, and that cultural practice effectively concede other cases. And so some clerics had to grapple with the question of whether they would go back to their villages during Ramadan, which was, you know, part of the religious uh, practice in the country. So I think these cultural areas are very interesting. Okay, so what Steph just said about the importance of the cultural factor, that answers to the Rachel's, Rachel's uh, the question. Uh, so she asked, have you found any correlation on the use of the facial mask in South Korea and how, may, how this may have also controlled the outbreak? So yeah, I mean, we don't have a cultural evidence, but there is the association between the use of the facial mask by the cultural factor and then the slow spread of disease. I mean, that should be the one of the interesting the research topic, whether that association was the causal or not. Let me, uh, let me turn to the, the next question in the queue. Uh, again, um, 
uh, coming from Charles Elkin. Different question, can information disclosure place and get most of the benefit of contact tracing? So comparing this strategy not to one of general lockdown, but to the gains which are had uh, also on, on contact tracing. Uh, so I'm not 100% sure if I get the, the right definition of the, the contact tracing here. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so the information disclosure uh -huh. is telling a citizen mm -hmm. where a case has taken place. But this is complementary to a strategy which also, once a, an affected person has been identified, to very carefully trace back all the people with whom that individual has been infected. Those are, those are two different streams of public policy in effect, correct? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay, now I get that. Yes, yes. So the case of the Korea was clearly the combination of the both. So there has been Again, somewhat voluntary contact tracing. So if you get the information that I have, I have a chance to interact with that confirmed case. So then he or she is more likely to visit the hospital and get tested. So that's the anticipated the voluntary contact tracing coming from the information disclosure. Correct. So those two methods are definitely complementary. So I don't see the reason I, I don't see the reason why the, the having that information the government choose one versus the other strategy mm -hmm. but we can think about that strategy too one versus the other strategy through the volunteer the, the voluntary the contact tracing the information disclosure itself could could get some benefits coming from the, the contact tracing not at the same degree but partially at least Right. And let me just uh, editorialize as well, because Charles makes another point in his question, which is important, which is that uh, contract tracing is effective only at lower numbers and where you have it very well institutionalized. Because, of mm -hmm. course, once the numbers start to grow very large, it's extremely difficult to do this late. Um, for example, in Taiwan, very tight integration, and this is interesting, between customs records of who was coming into the country and public health records so that the Taiwanese authorities could not only tell if someone was sick, but they could tell where they came from without contacting the individual by integrating customs and health records. So having a strategy that permits you to contact trace uh, is really important in shutting this down quickly once the numbers grow, you're really just mitigating. You're not trying to, you're not closing it down. You're just trying to reduce harm. And that's why the one lesson which emerges to this, I think everyone has agreed on, is that speed is essential. Because exponential growth in those early stages, if you let it go, you just get this catastrophic rise in cases. Uh, another question from uh, Charles. Suppose 1% uh, of shops are contaminated, and my personal calculus is that I'll visit any place that has less than 3% chance of contamination. Uh, uh, can you talk about, uh, I mean, this is, uh, he, Charles has a really rationalist conception of how people behave, which is good. Sure, sure. You as an economist will like that. But maybe you can speak to these sorts of calculations. It sounds like some of your findings suggest that if a place is contaminated, People don't go there at all. The business really go, falls to zero, basically. Yeah, sure. I mean, for sure, I like this numerical example. I'm an economist, so and people are making their rational choice based on the information. So I'm going to talk about the more general the setup instead of my model. So my model is calculating the risk of the being infected in the specific district, but even within the district you can choose your behavior by visiting the different coffee shops. So what is happening in the real world is that once the one coffee shop is disclosed, people can still take some risk, okay? So I still want to go to that district, but I will never go to the coffee shop with a confirmed case. So they can still change their behavior by visiting the other the, the coffee shops. And I think this behavior could be happening 
under the lockdown or even without, I mean, under the information disclosure, even with the lockdown, if we don't the, assume the complete the lockdown situation. But yeah, I mean, I really like this, the numerical calculation, and I can clearly see that the Charles Erkan gets the, 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 the important point of the, today's talk. Basically, the people make their committing behavior based on the information and following, sometimes not following the government policy. Yeah, good. Okay, well, listen, now there are two more questions, and I'm going to pose both of them and let you answer, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Kyle Rose asks a very interesting question about the size and geography of the country. Uh, you know, the fact that the DMZ effectively makes South Korea an island, uh, Hong Kong's border, you know, is, is, is de facto an international border. Taiwan, one of the most successful cases in Asia, probably the most successful case. I think the total number of cases in Taiwan is only about 250. Um, is there something about geography that made this easier for Korea to do? I actually have an answer on that, and then we'll, I'll give you one more question. Okay, so, okay, so uh, first of all, Korea was unlucky to be next to the China. China was the, the, the center of the outbreak that the, the disease started from the China. So China, the Korea was kind of unlucky next to, to be next to the China. But for the contact tracing and for the geographical mitigation strategy, Korea is the Korea is a small country. So it was possible to do the better contact tracing than other the large size economies. Okay, so that's, okay. What, yeah. what is your well, answer? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that, you know, the, the question of closing the border to high caseload areas has become very politicized in the United States. But if you think about it, it's fairly obvious that you want to control the spread of the disease from any country which it's emanating from. And so closing the border is not an irrational thing to do at all. It's a quite rational thing to do. And I think that Hong Kong and particularly Taiwan moved very rapidly to close the border. And by closing the border, I don't mean necessarily restricting all entry, but just guaranteeing that everyone who came in was tested. And just to give you a sense of the extent of this in Hong Kong, they were testing people at the airport and they were putting people directly into quarantine. I mean, that, that's how seriously they took this. And so the U.S. border was nominally closed, but people were still coming in and weren't being tested or quarantined. Okay, the last question, and this is a great place to stop, Ora Gonzalez asks, where does the privacy concern specifically come from? Is it from sending texts to alert people of cases near them, or is it from having to track where people have been, or is it from their self, uh, giving up their cell phone data and so forth? You know, where is the source of the of the privacy concern. That's a great way to end because I think that's one of the big policy questions for adopting the Korean model. Yeah, that's true. There is the privacy concern and it is mostly on the detailed the travel information. So just disclosing the number of the cases by district, so there is almost no chance of the identifying the specific individual. But still, that could be harmful for the businesses in that district. So I'm not saying that there is a zero cost, but the privacy concern is mostly on the, the disclosing the, the detailed the route information. So in that sense, the partial disclosure, disclosing only the number of the total confirmed cases, sending that information by the text message could be effective because the, its effectiveness is kind, kind of in the middle, but it's almost free from the privacy concern. Yeah. Uh, anyway, great questions. Munso, research, very exemplary of what we, we value at GPS. Uh, for those, the upcoming topics about North Korea, uh, about the missile program, and about Todd Henry's new book on Queer Korea, please join us in upcoming sessions. If you can register, we'd appreciate it, and we'll see you online next time.